A shrouded conspiracy unfurled in the dim and flickering shadows of Emperor Hirohito's palace. The loyal Imperial Guard tasked with his protection had been insidiously replaced by insurgent soldiers, seizing control of the Imperial Palace and its intricate surroundings. Tensions arose like a ticking time bomb as the pivotal moment when Emperor Hirohito was to broadcast Japan's capitulation to the Allied powers approached. The relentless conspirators, fervently set on waging war, were prepared to give up their lives to thwart the impending surrender. An urgent frenzy overtook the rebels as they rampaged through the palace, scouring every corner for the audio recordings Hirohito had crafted. However, the palace's enigmatic design concealed an elaborate maze of serpentine passages, secret doors, and veiled vaults, making locating the records a daunting ordeal. As the insurgents smashed through every barrier and Tokyo spiraled into chaos, the brave custodian slipped into a hidden passage behind a cupboard, where they safeguarded the Emperor's message and the hopes of a besieged nation yearning to end the brutal war. Carnage surged through the capital as the masterminds behind the Kyujo incident orchestrated a ruthless coup to prevent Japan from yielding to the inevitable. Accepting Defeat in the waning days of World War II, the proud Japanese Empire had sworn to fight until their last breath, defying the very notion of surrender. The Allies, confronting this unyielding nation, issued a chilling ultimatum at the Potsdam Conference on July 26, 1945. Either they submitted to immediate, unconditional surrender, or faced prompt and utter destruction. The Japanese officials, however, dismissed the warning as mere political rhetoric. After a grueling, protracted island-hopping campaign, the Allies vanquished the Japanese grip on the Pacific, sending them hurtling back into the waters and circling their homeland. The crushing defeat in Okinawa left the Japanese forces in tatters, and provided the U.S. with an airbase to launch devastating airstrikes. Even so, Japan's leaders remained obstinate. Only the apocalyptic might of atomic bombs unleashed on top of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, coupled with the Soviet invasion and seizure of Manchuria, made the Japanese confront the harsh reality of their impending annihilation. Consequently, the Supreme Council for the Direction of War convened before the Japanese Imperial Court, and Prime Minister Kantaro Suzuki, Navy Minister Mitsumasa Yonai, and Foreign Affairs Minister Shigenori Togo considered the terms of surrender within this hallowed chamber. When the air raid shelter session concluded, Suzuki summoned the council once more as an imperial conference graced by the emperor himself. In this final meeting, the Japanese high command made their case to decide on the nation's future. As tensions exploded amid the midnight bomb shelter assembly on August 13th, Hirohito finally made a decision, culminating in the historical acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration. However, a formidable challenge remained how to convey this unprecedented capitulation to the legions of Japanese servicemen and military officers that had been indoctrinated for years to embrace anything but defeat. From Tears to Sedition The decision to surrender sparked strong reactions from officers who wanted to continue resisting. At a session in the Ministry of War, staff officers expressed their discontent to Minister Korachika Anami. Many officers secluded themselves and broke into tears, while others began preparing to end their lives according to the traditional ritual of seppuku. Meanwhile, the Allies believed that Japanese sovereignty would be subordinated to them, an interpretation that many in the Japanese army understood as enslavement. Consequently, some army officers considered a coup d'etat necessary to avoid the shameful surrender and continue the fight until better ceasefire conditions could be negotiated. On August 12, 1945, young Major Kenji Hatanaka, wholly disheartened by the surrender announcement and after having bawled for hours, approached War Minister Anami, along with other officers, to ask for help to prevent the acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration. Anami did not commit to supporting them, but he did not decisively oppose the plan either. As such, the rebels proceeded with their coup plans, and Hatanaka spent the following days gathering allies and refining his plot. Anami's mind was split between his fervent desire to continue the war and his loyalty to the Emperor's wishes, even asking Chief of the Army General Staff Yoshijiro Umezu if, quote, the war should be continued even at the risk of launching a coup d'etat. Umezu urged the Minister of War to abide by the Emperor's wishes, and that night, at the Army Ministry, 
a group of senior officers gathered to discuss the growing threat of a coup d'etat. General Toroshiro Kawabe then proposed a written agreement to carry out the Emperor's surrender, and the accord was signed by all high-ranking officers present as a last resort defense against any coup attempts. Not being a member of the Japanese High Command, the conspirator Kenji Hatanaka was not aware of the rampart that had been built to protect the government from any coup attempts. As such, he proceeded to execute his plan. The Plot in Action The stage was set, and as the clock struck 9.30 on the night of August 14th, Hatanaka's rebel forces sprang into action, infiltrating the palace grounds with cunning efficiency. The second regiment of the first Imperial Guards soon entered the palace, doubling the battalion's strength. Little did they know that Hatanaka and Lieutenant Colonel Jiro Shizaki had already convinced their commander, Colonel Toyojiro Haga, to join their cause with false claims, assuring him that Anami was on board with their plan, and that General Takeshi Mori would soon join the cause as well. With time running out before the military realized the extent of the conspiracy, Hatanaka also attempted to persuade General Shizuichi Tanaka and Lieutenant General Takeshi Mori to support the cause. But when Mori refused, a heated argument erupted between the two men, and Hatanaka executed the general in cold blood. He then used his official seal to stamp false orders to continue with the plot. The fraudulent orders allowed Hatanaka to post soldiers all around the Imperial Palace and to take control of the broadcast station where the surrender recordings were to be transmitted. But the most crucial piece of the puzzle was missing, as Lord of the Privy Seal, Koichi Kido, had personally taken the recording into a secret vault when the invaders entered the palace. The rebels searched for hours within the sprawling palace grounds and became more aggressive by the minute, ransacking every nook and cranny. However, the palace was a labyrinthine enigma, with each room nearly identical to the last, and doors marked with a mysterious code that the invaders couldn't decipher. A City in Chaos the heart of Tokyo pounded with an electric intensity as Hatanaka's plot unfurled with lightning speed. The night was already tense, but the events that unfolded made it all the more remarkable. Other rebels, led by Captain Takeo Sasaki, had their own seditious plans. They set the Prime Minister's official residence ablaze, hoping to catch the family inside. But the cunning Suzuki had anticipated their move and kept his family one step ahead, out of harm's way. Undeterred, the renegades went on a scorching rampage, burning everything in their path. They targeted not only Suzuki's personal home, but also the residences of his close family. The night was filled with the roar of flames as the rebels raged through the city. As dawn approached, it became clear that the coup attempts were not going as planned. Suzuki was safe, and Hatanaka's men could still not locate the recordings. The military officers who had joined Hatanaka's cause were now highly suspicious, and the discovery of Mori's body only fueled their suspicion. Hatanaka was desperate to contact the Minister of War, and was confident that he could convince him to join the coup. But Anami was resolute in his commitment to the pact, which promised not to support such attempts. As the sun began to rise, he was already preparing for the ritualistic suicide of seppuku. The clock was ticking, and Hatanaka's hopes were slipping away. He then rushed to the NHK radio facilities, where he and his men attempted to stop the broadcast of the recordings. When that failed, he demanded to speak to the nation before the Emperor's recording aired. The brave broadcast personnel resisted his threats, even when Hatanaka pointed a gun at them. By now, the Eastern District Army was closing in, forcing Hatanaka to confront General Tanaka, who tried to persuade him to abandon his cause. Aftershock At 12 p.m. on August 15, 1945, the fate of World War II was sealed, and every Japanese citizen knew it, their hearts heavy with the weight of their war-torn nation. Their leader's voice was heard over the radio for the first time in history, solemnly surrendering to the will of the Allied forces. It was a moment that would be etched in their memories forever. Meanwhile, Hatanaka and Shizaki rode across the streets of Tokyo, frantically tossing leaflets that explained their motives. The coup may have failed, but they could not end their ordeal in dishonor. However, their efforts were futile, and soon Hatanaka took his own life with a single shot to the head. The sun rose on a new day, but the memory of that dreadful night would never fade. It was a night of chaos and confusion, of rebellion and desperation. And though the coup had failed, its impact would be felt for years to come.
Thank you for watching Dark Docs. For more intriguing wartime stories, subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell. And if you want to delve into how technology was used in modern history's most brutal battles, click on your screen and check out our other Dark Documentaries channels. We publish regularly, so stay tuned.